All right, well, it is 11 a.m. here on the East Coast, and hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're pleased to bring you the latest in our 2017 webinar series on the topic of fighting Zika with technology and equity crowdfunding. My name is Yana Aranda, and I am the president of Engineering for Change. I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. The webinar you're participating in today is part of E4C's professional development offering. Information on upcoming webinars in the series, as well as archive videos of past presentations, can be found on the E4C webinars webpage, as well as on our YouTube channel and also on our webpage. Both of the URLs are listed here. If you have any questions, comments, and recommendations for future topics and speakers, please contact the E4C webinar series team at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. If you're following us on Twitter today, I encourage you to join our conversation with the hashtag E4C webinars and follow our Twitter handle here at engineer for change. Before we move on to our presenter, I'd like to tell you a bit about Engineering for Change and who we are. E4C is a knowledge organization and global community of over one million engineers, designers, development practitioners, or social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities worldwide. Some of those challenges can include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy and off-grid scenarios, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to become a member of E4C. Membership is free and provides access to our news, data on hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and information opportunities such as jobs, conferences, and fellowships. E4C members enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with the E4C site, the better we'll be able to serve you resources aligned to your interests. For more, please visit our website, and sign up. Our next webinar will be on August 23rd on the topic of new technologies for connecting the unconnected. And we'll be joined by Sharada Srinivasan of One World Connected. Um, this will be a really exciting webinar focusing on ICT for D, and we encourage you all to join us. Please see the E4C professional development page soon for more information and registration details. If you're already an E4C member, we'll be sending you an invitation to the webinar directly. Now, a few housekeeping items before we get started. Let's practice using this platform by telling us where in the world you are. In the chat window, which is located at the bottom right of your screen, please type in your location. And I'll go ahead and get us started by letting you all know where I am. I see we already have folks entering their feedback. So I'm here in Brooklyn. We already have uh, someone here from Denver. Uh, please feel free to enter your location into the chat. And um, all of your questions should be reserved into the Q&A window, which is located immediately below the chat. And I do see that folks are already using the Q&A window to answer uh, this question in particular, but uh, do use a chat window. So thank you for joining us from Athens, Ohio, from Oregon, from Chicago, from Rhode Island, and all around the states. We'll see if we have anybody from around the world. Um, the Q&A window should be used for questions, which are going to be a reserve for the presenters, and that way we'll be able to keep track of all those. If you're listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any trouble, try hitting stop and then start. You may also want to try opening up WebEx in a different browser. As you may be aware, e webinars qualify engineers for one professional development hour. To request your professional development hour, please follow the instructions on the top of the e professional development page after the presentation, and the link is listed here. All right, all the way as far as Hawaii. Thanks, everyone. Welcome. So I'd like to take a moment to tell you a little bit about today's webinar and our presenter. For most social enterprises, especially for hardware-led social ventures, fundraising is one of the biggest challenges. The emerging practice of equity crowdfunding is best known for its capability to scale and bring products to market. Today, we are very pleased to be joined by Meg Worth, the CEO and co-founder of the social enterprise Matronova. 
Meg will share insights on how equity crowdfunding enables the development of Metronova's vector control technology solution in response to the threat of the Zika virus in 2016. Um, and prior to Metronova, Meg has advised a socially conscious venture capital fund on its global health strategy. She has also worked for the Rockefeller Foundation and the United Nations Millennium Project and is published in the field of maternal health policy and innovation. Meg really leads the charge and innovative approaches to maternal, newborn, child, and reproductive health, and we are so honored to have her join us to share her insights today. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Meg. Hi, Yana. Hello. Hi, Yana. Hi. Hi, thank you so much for the introduction and uh, for the opportunity to speak uh, to this group. Uh, we're very excited here at Maternova to share our experience um, with uh, our most recent proprietary innovation and um, in particular to talk through the process um, and the promise of uh, equity crowdfunding. Just give me one minute for the, uh, the no slides. Okay. There we go. Uh, so uh, let me start by telling you a little bit about Matronova. Uh, we are uh, a an social enterprise with a global focus. Um, our mission is to accelerate the speed at which innovative technologies are adopted and distributed, um, particularly focused on the time of childbirth, uh, which is a time of greatest risk for mother and newborn in many countries around the world, uh, including the United States. Um, if you'd like to uh, follow us on Twitter, the Twitter handle is at Maternova. Um, I'll be telling you more about the um, uh, textile uh, product that is our latest innovation to fight Zika, and that has its own Twitter handle and, and following. But I'd like to tell you a little bit about Maternova first. Um, we are very pleased to have partnered for this project with AmeriCares and with Alessandra Gold, and we are um, funded, as you'll hear, through equity crowdfunding through a platform called Republic, uh, which has become a tremendous partner of ours. And the initial grant uh, as part of a Zika challenge came from Grand Challenges Canada through CamTech. Um, so a lot of folks were involved in, in facilitating this process and we really like to, you know, it's fun to talk about because it is so very different. Um, uh, the title of the seminar is a novel wearable solution and those of you who are deep into the global health Face will understand the the, not, uh, the pun there. Um, solution to fight mosquito-borne illness and launch with uh, equity crowdfunding. So a couple of highlights about us. Um, we are still a startup, but we do have some excellent traction behind us. We are a revenue-generating company. Um, we do a lot of our work through e-commerce. Um, we focus, as I said, on maternal, newborn uh, devices and diagnostics. For the most part, the bread and butter of our work uh, is on identifying, testing, and then scaling access to what sounds like fairly typical products in the maternal and newborn health space, um, new kinds of uh, incubators, new kinds of jaundice devices, uh, new ways to stop postpartum hemorrhage. Um, However, usually these are truly faster, better, cheaper, more rugged, and very innovative products. I'll be able to tell you a little bit about them in a moment. But that's the bread and butter of, of what we do, and you'll see why uh, the Zika innovation is, is so different. Um, and then finally, funding we've raised has been through angel investors and uh, equity crowdfunding is the majority of it. Um, it's my job to make it look easy, um, but I can tell you it's been, you know, a very long and uh, up and down process, and uh, we're happy to be where we are today. So, um, you know, a little bit more, we deliver innovative solutions for obstetric, newborn, and reproductive health in emerging markets via e-commerce. We're building a network of professionals, 
um, providers, decision makers, uh, frontline health pro professionals who we reach through uh, a, a list that we've um, developed in-house as well as through social media. What we tend to do is carve out or create through our own inventions exclusive distribution rights and in-country distributor ne networks. Uh, and then we also do spend quite a great deal of time on making sure that the devices are safe. Um, uh, not only have they gotten the proper regulatory approval, but we have used our network to test the product uh, and they have provided specialized qualitative and quantitative feedback. Uh, so this is all with the idea of building a platform and a brand that can be trusted over time so that people know, um, you know, we're only going to carry the products that work. A uh, couple of the innovations that we do distribute um, that we're, you know, very proud of for a, a range of, of reasons. Our signature um, focus and is on postpartum hemorrhage. As many of you may know, this is um, uh, postpartum hemorrhage is a leading cause uh, of death for women around the time of childbirth. It is truly an obstetric emergency. Uh, you have two hours to save a woman's life once she starts a massive hemorrhage. Uh, if you cannot get her to to, um, to transfusion, to care, to a to a um, a series of other clinical interventions. So this is perhaps one of our most um, beloved uh, devices because it is so simple. It's a neoprene suit. It's entirely external. Um, it's it's uh, not non pharmaceutical. Basically, it's um, a compression device uh, that, that wraps around a woman's body and uh, auto-transfuses blood to the core of her body. I mentioned that um, so you get a sense of uh, a range of postpartum hemorrhage devices that we research and then actually distribute. Uh, the next example is more in what you might think of as a typical medical um, device. Um, but each of them has a very interesting, often decade-long history behind its development, and I could do a webinar on each and every one of these. But um, the first one is the Cradle by Microlife, developed by King's College, and it is the first and only rugged handheld um, blood pressure monitor that is specifically calibrated and tested to detect hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. Uh, so there's a lot to unpack there, but it is uh, an amazing um, little device unlike anything else that is out there. And the item below that is uh, we have partnered with Philips. That is a wind-up fetal heart rate monitor um, that, uh, you know, allows you to m monitor uh, fetal heart rate, a Doppler, off the grid. Um, then finally in the third column, an example of infant warming and hypothermia, uh, we have the warmy loo device, uh, which is uh, to warm infants either in transport, in the home, or um, in a facility, uh, it's been used for all of those um, purposes. You can check that up on our, our website. Uh, it's very exciting and very uh, low-cost reusable device. Finally, in the lower right, um, another one of these very interesting global health products that has perhaps a 15-year history behind it. And, and we've been involved for, I would say, the last eight years in total in researching um, the uh, attributes of the device, uh, pilot testing in different settings, adaptations of the device, and this is a stick-on liquid crystal thermometer that allows non-literate, non-numerate uh, mothers and healthcare workers to test, um, actually to be alerted to the core temperature of, um, of an infant. Um, so it was developed to detect hypothermia, um, um, but we are actually working uh, with a partner to expand its use to develop both high fever and hypothermia. And this is, um, you know, in, in large volumes, this costs just, uh, you know, perhaps 15 cents for a reusable uh, little device. So that's a, um, a very quick overview, uh, let's see, five examples of about 45 different products that we distribute. And just to give you an idea of, of the type of work that we were doing, um, and researching uh, when the Zika challenge came along. Um, because I know a lot of folks on the line might be most interested in the equity crowdfunding, this is the, the issue that plagues all of us uh, with, with tech and other startups is, is um, how, do you, how do you raise funds? We have been fortunate enough to have a very positive experience, so I just want to 
insert here a quick overview. Um, on the right, you will see the other sources of funding that Matternova has used over the last uh, five plus years. We started with grants, um, both a couple small and large. We then moved, um, we had loans. We raised a seed round from Impact uh, or, or uh, Social Enterprise Angels. Um, and we, we were able to raise some funds through prizes and business plan competitions. We did one small but successful, very small crowdfunding round on MedStarter. So these are all the pieces uh, that we've used. And I know a lot of uh, other entrepreneurs who are listening uh, will, will be familiar with putting together a, a range of different uh, sources of funding. What happened uh, in early 2016 was that equity crowdfund, well, actually Republic um, approached us and equity crowdfunding really burst upon the scene. Um, in short, what equity crowdfunding funding does is it democratizes angel investing. So taking the model uh, of, of the general crowdfunding, it actually applies that to the general public. And what was once a very uh, exclusive club made up of folks who had a certain number of million dollars or more in assets or in the bank, those were called angel investors, what was once this exclusive club uh, has now been opened, at least in the U.S. and other places where the legislation allows it, uh, it has now been opened to the crowd. So what are the implications of that? That means Instead of um, a startup or a team going only to accredited angels, um, they can actually, and as we did, they can raise um, actual investment from the crowd, uh, something that was literally impossible to do because of the SEC regulations uh, even a couple of years ago. Um, so this, this is really a sea change, and it's, um, it's hard to – uh, it, it, it's hard to overstate um, what it means for, for startups. Um, why else did we work with Republic and, and go for equity crowdfunding? Uh, we loved the fact that they focused on impact and women-led companies. So they are, a, you know, a, a typical equity crowdfunding platform, but they see impact and women-led companies as key to their growth and to uh, overall growth. Uh, and uh, so we found this very, very exciting. Uh, second, um, equity crowdfunding, we, you know, there, there's a lot of details on this, but there's less obsession with valuation of the company. So uh, when we've worked with traditional angels, we've spent months talking about how much the company is worth. The way that equity crowdfunding works is that, you know, you, you spend less time on that is the simplest way to say it. And um, there is an implicit understanding that it is hard to value an early stage company and you're able to just move ahead, um, postponing that issue. Um, third, as I mentioned, this is really the key and the light bulb is, is democratization of angel investing. Um, we love anything that democratizes um, finance, um, financing startups and uh, technology. So that was a no-brainer for us. Um, faster and potentially less resource intensive than angel groups. Uh, yes, we, from start to finish, the whole campaign was about seven months. So uh, that certainly proved to be the case, uh, that, that it was uh, much faster. Um, and it's just more creative, which also fits our mindset, um, open to investors um, and opening the whole concept of, of investing to other engineers, to uh, social scientists, to really anyone who, who uh, had a passion for the idea and saw the promise. Okay. So I will um, say more about the equity crowdfunding, but encourage you to look at republic.co. Um, to look at our campaign, which is, which is closed and was uh, successful um, and helped to launch the product that I'm going to talk about uh, right now. And I will pause for one minute here. Okay. 
So if we go to the next slide, um, I want to delve into the technology itself. Um, as you could tell, we were very focused on traditional medical devices and diagnostics, and uh, suddenly, um, at least from the public's point of view, the Zika virus swept onto the scene as a very unique threat to pregnant women. Um, at first, our response was, well, you know, we'll look for a rapid test, and as soon as a rapid test becomes available, we will distribute that to our current network and let them know um, what's available. But we had also been doing um, quite a bit of research on uh, textile and nanotechnology for a number of the different products on which we work. So um, let's go to the Zika virus, and I think most people will will know what is so disturbing. We we don't want to you know put up a lot of disturbing photos here. Everyone's probably seen them, but the risk of microcephaly of a brain and skull that's smaller than normal in the fetus uh, is much higher, particularly in the first few months of pregnancy, if a person is um, uh, uh, contracts the Zika virus from the bite of a mosquito. It does involve um, and result in lifelong brain damage and disability, uh, lifelong suffering for the family and the child. Uh, you know, this isn't just a uh, physiological or, or physical um, uh, abnormality, you know, there, there's quite a bit of um, pain and, and suffering involved. Um, and the other just piece to note, what's different, um, because a lot of folks will be familiar with malaria, the Zika virus is, is uh, transmitted in the daytime for the most part. And we will talk quite a bit about how the um, knowledge of the way the virus is transmitted and the way uh, that it particularly affects women um, is relevant to the design process of, of the technology that we're we're working on. So this is uh, clearly um, women and men have been battling uh, the mosquito uh, for for time immemorial, and we're all familiar with um, other vector control methods that are working well inside, particularly the bed net pictured here. Um, uh, and then in the next slide, other vector control methods for outside spraying. Uh, we were fortunate to be part of a, a, a Zika network um, uh, put together by, by Camtech and learned about all kinds of fascinating technologies from larva, larvicides uh, to put in the, the drinking water or the rainwater fish that you may have heard about that would eat the larvae of the, uh, the culprit mosquito, um, quite a range of identification of, of the mosquito, um, mobile health, I mean, the number of innovations and then moving into uh, vaccines as well as um, a genetically modified mosquitoes. Uh, there is no shortage of innovation there. So we weren't sure at first what our role uh, would be. What we did know is that um, our network focused on women, um, empowering women, and all of our research and all of our advisors um, focused on, on women. And what we did know is that women who were pregnant were very afraid. There were the, the news stories uh, and the data on women hiding inside. Um, and their only option seemed to be, uh, you know, in a, in a personal sense, was to spray themselves with insecticide. Um, for those of us who are ecologically and environmentally minded, um, this is often a trade-off um, and comes with some questions. If I'm spraying DEET on my clothes and my skin, what do we know about uh, um, the impact of that uh, crossing the placenta? And there's a lot of open questions there. So we set about um, and we worked uh, with the Camtech team uh, and we focused on nanotechnology and particularly on textile. And the, the fabric and innovations that we had uh, uncovered basically um, looked at repellent in a new way. Instead of um, spraying it onto the skin or spraying it onto the fabric in the, in the course of, manu or actually after the, the manufacturing process as a separate step, um, this new technology embedded 
uh, the insecticide or the repellent at a molecular level as part of the fabric. Um, it's a repellent with a longstanding safety profile in Europe and elsewhere. Um, when it was um, put into this form, um, it has no, no odor um, and it, it rests on the, on the outside of the, of the fabric. Um, what is most important about it is that it, uh, it uh, retains its strength over many, many washings. So often when you get at a textile that's been sprayed with permethrin, et cetera, it really doesn't last for a terribly long time. Um, so these are just a few of the, the aspects of uh, the technology that were so exciting to us. And we, uh, we decided to enter um, the idea and put it in front of Grand Challenges. And what was truly innovative uh, from a gender perspective was thinking about this from the point of view of a pregnant woman, all of us on the team having held that identity at one point, um, and being able to really um, talk, talk to women and midwives and OBGYNs around the world about what was missing. Um, if you think about the inside and outside vector control, um, a lot of that works well for, let's say, for malaria, where you're, you tuck yourself under a bed net for the evening. What's different about Zika and the risk to women is, first of all, its greatest risk is to pregnant women in the early stages of their pregnancy when they may not know they are pregnant. Uh, second of all, women, um, women work. They work uh, outside the home, around the home. They travel to gather water and other materials. They may sell uh, in commercial areas, um, in the suburban and urban areas that are at greatest risk of Zika. Uh, so there are many aspects to a person moving through time and space that really were not well covered. Um, again, if we go back to the um, if we go back to the spray, it's just not culturally acceptable in many countries um, to spray yourself from head to toe with um, an, a repellent that does smell. It's also, frankly, quite um, quite costly. And we developed a partnership with Americares and worked uh, quite a bit in El Salvador to validate um, some of the cost and user perceptions uh, related to mosquito protection. So what was truly innovative uh, for us was putting together cutting edge science, the nanotechnology material, uh, fashion, which I'll get into in a minute, and then our global distribution ability and being able to see that there could really be a market for something that was truly woman controlled that was not specific to pregnancy but could encompass pregnancy. Uh, and that, that item was really uh, apparel. Um, so we go back to, uh, again, controlled by, by the woman, worn by the woman, travels with her wherever she goes, costs less than, um, costs less than you know, a pregnancy long supply of insecticide and is something that she actually wants to use. And I think that's where the fashion piece comes into this. Does it mean high fashion and couture? Well, in this case, we were lucky enough to partner with someone where it, it did, did mean that. But our central premise was, and my co-founder, uh, Allison, will, will often say, you know, women should not feel punished for protecting themselves from Zika. And, and if you're wearing, um, a net or, or spraying yourself with something that doesn't smell, that doesn't smell good, it, is, it, it can feel like a punishment, um, nor should women have to, to huddle and hide inside. So it was really an empowerment piece that we were interested in. What is something they could use that was a technology but that they would be actually proud to use and in this case wear? So the first sketches were, you know, pretty basic, but we had to get started. You know, we knew we had to get started uh, in El Salvador, we had a very exciting partnership with AmeriCares in that um, they were already giving out uh, anti-Zika mother kits to all of their pregnant women. So um, they were very interested in doing a qualitative study with all of the pregnant women to see what their response would be to protective apparel uh, that was uh, embedded with the nanotechnology. So this is... Uh, you know, it's very basic. We created a very uh, quick but semi-attractive um, 
uh, maternity T-shirt that looks like a normal T-shirt but does have the technology embedded, and this was the prototype while uh, we were developing something a little bit uh, um, more elegant. Um, this is the team in El Salvador showing the shirt to the pregnant women. It was embedded as part of the training for both the community health workers, uh, the, um, the obstetrician, and the women were all told about the repellent being embedded in the shirts, and then they wore them and provided uh, feedback. And uh, let's go to the next slide. Here you can see they've got some of the training materials on the right, and the, the women have the shirts. So um, uh, th this was part of what we were working on from early 2016 through to the to the fall. <clears throat> Okay. All right, so um, we, as I mentioned, we did want to partner uh, with, with someone, you know, fashion is, is not, is perhaps a hobby, but certainly um, not the core competency of Modern Nova. We were fortunate enough to be able to partner with someone who really understood a few things. First of all, she, Alessandra Gold, uh, understood the threat of Zika. She was born in uh, Brazil, and her family still lives and works there. And actually, it, her city of origin was the third most impacted by the Zika virus. So here's someone who is um, from from Brazil, understands the fear, is a mother herself, but most importantly, she is a, a well-known uh, designer, and she understands what women uh, want and like to wear. Uh, so we were very fortunate to partner with Alessandra Gold for the designs uh, of the the um, product itself. And you can see, let's see. And over the course of of a several months, with the input from the groups in El Salvador, as well as the input from uh, a number of specialists in Zika, four pieces were designed with the vector behavior in mind. In this case, it is uh, a mosquito that bites in the day, a mosquito that um, likes to, to um, actually, we learned, uh, is attracted to darker fabrics and colors. Uh, so this was a reason to, to make it light. Um, it uh, is attracted to the legs. So the leggings actually, as pictured here, they'll actually be longer. They're actually, um, the manufacturing run that is in now will, will be quite a bit longer. Um, and and so, uh, you know, covering the hands as well, you can see in the cardigan in the upper right, we are covering as much of the body as possible with a light fabric. Each piece is imbued with the repellent, the nanotechnology textile. And um, these are these are the final uh, prototypes and the final design for the first run of the Nova Vale protective apparel line. Uh, the maternity dress um, is really quite ingenious. Um, you know, we need something that can be elegant, um, that can be worn by someone who doesn't look pregnant and, in fact, is not pregnant. Um, eventually, what we anticipate is that adolescent girls and women would be wearing um, mosquito protective apparel, and so it would not become uh, a stigmatized um, statement that you're wearing uh, something and announcing to the world that you are pregnant. We have um, ourselves put on this um, dress, and when it cinches um, to a non-pregnant body, it, it just looks like a regular dress. The internal ties expand so that you could change the sizing every day as the belly expands. So it's really thoughtfully designed to be extremely flexible based on um, what women need during this critical time. Again, it's a, it's a time of vulnerability to a disease that has lifelong implications for the entire family. So we keep going back to that. And the more we learn about this mosquito uh, and the, the spread of, of the disease, um, the faster we can adapt and, and uh, shift. Okay. So I've told you a little bit about Matter Nova and a bit about how we um, funded uh, the early part of our work and then how the equity crowdfunding became uh, a really exciting 
vehicle for us. Um, you know, going to a bunch of male angel investors, and I hate to generalize, but this has been our experience in telling them that we're creating a specialized uh, maternity dress with nanotechnology, it's, it's just not a sell. Um, it's just not something that is typically uh, related to. But when we went on Republic and we embraced the crowd um, and they embraced the idea, uh, it was a very different experience. Everyone can relate to um, being pregnant, having a pregnant relative, um, and, and uh, could, could personally resonate with the, really the fear uh, of the Zika virus. And so um, combining all of these messages uh, has not been straightforward or easy, but it was very readily done on, um, on the Republic uh, site. So fashion meets vector control. Um, we are still working on the messaging around this as, um, as the Zika epidemic ebbs and flows. And, uh, you know, there was some concern when at some point uh, the WHO declared Zika no longer an emergency. Um, but if you, you know, stay uh, in touch with the folks on the ground and the, the um, CDC and others tracking the disease, because it's no longer emergency uh, is not necessarily good news. It means it's settled in in some, some areas, and there are many folks who are waiting to see how and when and if uh, Zika does make a comeback. In the meantime, it has uh, affected thousands and thousands of, of, of women with, I believe it's the latest count is 2,600 infants born with the microcephaly and the lifelong uh, burden just in Brazil alone. It is also still being found in, in areas of the U.S. Um, but beyond Zika, you know, it's very important to note that we, we think that um, that this idea of personal protective apparel that people actually want to wear uh, will have very interesting implications uh, in the fight against other illnesses. First of all, the same mosquito that carries Zika also transmits uh, dengue, yellow fever, which you will have seen in the news this year in Brazil, and chikungunya. Um, some recent uh, work has shown that the single bite of one mosquito can transmit two or three of these at once. Uh, um, and so you begin to look at ways in which uh, protective apparel could have a very uh, long, uh, cast a wide net, so to speak. Um, beyond that, uh, there's a bit of research about uh, malaria and biting, you know, sort of in the early evening when people are not tucked away under their bed nets and, and are at risk of the malaria um, uh, mosquito transmitting uh, disease. And then finally, another massive public health, uh, really it is an emergency at this point in the U.S., um, is uh, Lyme, Lyme disease. And uh, this textile does repel um, the ticks that carry Lyme, and so we're looking at that piece as well. But uh, it, it is an interesting case of a um, solution to a particular disease that was very specific to time and place, but actually has, um, you know, very, very wide-ranging implications um, to some of the, the truly the scourges of, of uh, man and, and womankind um, as far as fighting um, disease in a new way. Now, we would never uh, say that people should wear this, you know, wear a dress and therefore, you know, um, be protected. The recommendations will always be that you also want to apply some skin-based repellent, that you also want to use a bed net, that with Zika you also need to use condoms because of, it is a sexually transmitted disease. And you also want to do all of the other vector control methods. But we do think that it is a very new uh, tool, uh, and we are working with some groups to test a very um, basic but still attractive uh, version of this dress in refugee camps uh, and elsewhere for adolescent and uh, um, women of, of childbearing age who are at risk. So I'm going to wrap up in about four or five minutes so that we can uh, 
we can get to questions, but I want to just circle back to the equity crowdfunding on Republic. Um, there are other platforms as well. We can only speak to our own experience. Um, and the fact that the timing was, was perfect here. We have, you know, not been so lucky with the timing on other um, financing rounds. And so uh, it, it's, um, you know, it's, it's a joy, uh, frankly, to be able to talk about this one. Um, we were one of the first four companies to launch on the platform. We were able to raise over $100,000 to launch NovaVail, and we did so in six months, which is uh, quite fast uh, for a company like Matter Nova, Women's Health, Global Health. Um, this is the, probably the most ex exciting piece is that we attracted dozens of new investors. Um, an investor, an angel slash equity investor on a crowdfunding platform like this, uh, can invest as little as 10 or $20 and become part of the company, um, can become an investor in the company. We had folks that did much larger investments, but uh, to us, each of these um, means a different kind of support and people are able to invest what, what is important to them. And, you know, what's important to people who can only invest $20 is, is different from what's important to others, and, and that's uh, what's so exciting about this mechanism. Um, and then in doing that, we, as I mentioned, we, we feel like we were able to participate in the democratization of, of angel investing. Um, just to speak briefly about our market opportunity for the Nova Vale line, um, we are obviously looking first at early market penetration into Latin America, specifically in El Salvador where there already uh, are active users of the, um, the line, and we're doing a follow-up study in uh, with um, the folks in El Salvador to see how the women like the more complete outfits that were designed over the course of the fall and winter, um, so the full dress and the leggings. I should note here, because I think I left it out, that the um, qualitative results were really strong. Uh, so women, um, over 95% of them, liked wearing the apparel. They understood what it did. Um, they might have had some input on color and fit and that sort of thing, but in general, the response was quite quite strong and positive. Um, we'll, we'll also be looking at uh, engaging our in-country distribution partners uh, in West Africa and other um, places at risk of mosquito-borne illness, um, and government clients and ministries of health. So uh, this is a really new, <laughs> it's new territory. Um, we have to market it to some as purely fashion, and we have to market it to others as a public health intervention. And uh, we're working on doing the right uh, studies and uh, effectiveness trials to, to be able to do that um, wholeheartedly and, and with strong clinical evidence. Um, uh, with the confluence of, um, of the Republic launch, the threat of Zika and this innovative um, approach, we were lucky enough to be featured in Forbes, Smashable, and BBC, um, all of which helped to fuel demand and, and marketing of, of the product worldwide. But um, I think I will stop there and uh, have plenty of time for questions. Um, I think, you know, this, this particular example, um, we're really excited about it because it is um, truly woman-focused and girl-focused, and it's truly new and different. Uh, and, um, you know, we're interested in ideas, input, partners, um, people who want to pilot, uh, and uh, really all of the above to make this uh, a reality because we do believe that women, um, you know, who are carrying the next generation should not have to live in fear and should not have to feel as though um, they're being punished. They should feel empowered uh, as they move through their day. And uh, that's, that's where I'll leave it. Thanks, Yana. Thank you so much, Meg. And I, I have to tell you, this hits very close to home for me personally as uh, a recently new mother uh, who was actually quite nervous about travel. Um, we have mm. family in Puerto Rico, and that's a region that was hit also quite badly with Zika. So um, I, my heart goes out certainly to all 
of the pregnant women and the new mothers uh, throughout to these regions uh, that had to fear for you know their their children's lives and uh, this is really exciting to see your investment in new technologies. So uh, at this point, I'd certainly like to open up the floor to questions from all of our attendees um, for Meg. I'll go ahead and get us started with a couple of uh, questions that came to mind for me. Uh, of course, congratulations on your success with uh, Republic and your ability to attract investors. It's really exciting to, to hear your success story. I'd love to hear from you if you can share with uh, our attendees any tips uh, for effectively leveraging Republic or other equity crowdfunding platforms? Is it because you focused on one specific technology? Is that the key? Is there some other uh, methods that you found particularly uh, useful in, in uh, leveraging uh, the, the platform that you'd like to share? Sure, yes. Um, I mean, this is one of the things we have struggled with um, because we are, um, a marketplace we do you know a range of technologies and that is very hard uh, as it turns out it's hard to fundraise for at least in this in the global health space uh, and so I do think it's um, it, I, I don't know if we would have come to the attention of Republic because they did reach out to us if we hadn't had this new technology and so um, Although we personally are big believers in a range of technological and behavioral approaches to things, um, I would say that it, you know, it was because of this one proprietary product that I think um, we did get traction. So, so, uh, you know, that's that's the honest answer. No, appreciate your honesty, certainly. Um, so then. Uh, kind of building on that question, one of our attendees wants to know if there were any unique challenges with equity crowdfunding, um, and kind of building on that, how did, how did you gain momentum uh, on, on the platform on the round? Right. So I think the, one of the biggest challenges is that it's new. Um, and so anyone who is already, you know, an angel investor is going to be a little suspicious. Um, and and anyone who's got a, you know, a legal degree or, or just is inquisitive and curious is going to need and want and rightfully should spend a lot of time trying to figure out what equity crowdfunding is. And once you delve in, you know, it, it's a new, it's, it's, it's new. And so um, uh, anything that's new and a new mechanism, particularly in finance with legal implications, is, is going to take folks time to understand. So we have the sense that there are many, many folks who might have been interested who will wait it out to see how equity crowdfunding does in the long term. And so then you lose people there. So that's the first challenge is that it was new. Um, a second challenge is that uh, it was hard to get um, small international uh, investors. So mm -hmm. above a certain amount, um, the platform could orchestrate uh, investments from overseas, but you know what we lost out on is that true global crowd effect. And once that is sorted out, and I, I believe it will be, um, you know our audience is mostly global, and so you know we kind of had to work through that, and I think lost a lot of folks there as well. So if someone wanted to send in twenty dollars or five hundred dollars from uh, you know, Kenya, they, they couldn't do it for this round. Uh, so those were those were two challenges. And the third was um, the setup <laughs> um, from an organizational capacity point of view and, and just the, the things that you have to do to file with the SEC are quite monumental. Um, so this is not, you know, something oh. where you just load up your ideas and you're good to go. And it took us uh, – probably two months to, to prep it, um, working with their legal and accounting team. So it, it's, not, um, it's not an easy answer. So and just pulling on that thread, that, of course, um, yeah. just pulling on that thread a little bit, you mentioned that Republic provides you with support uh, from their legal team. And do you know, and I, I'm not suggesting that you are a Republic representative, so please feel free to 
hold on that answer, but do, you, do they generally provide support of that kind to all of the ventures who are on their platform, or is that unique to you because you're one of the first? There were definitely some um, perks to being in the first co cohort, but um, that said, it's not as though you're left on your own. I mean, they've learned a tremendous amount um, and have stre streamlined it further uh, and have amazing partners um, in legal and accounting who are who are continuing to be helpful to new uh, candidates. And I imagine it's the same for, for everyone. Okay, that's great to know. It's really helpful. Uh, another one of our listeners wants to know, and you mentioned that you actually did, uh, as part of your fundraising strategy, uh, do regular crowdfunding. So maybe you could speak to how Republic is different than let's say Kickstarter in terms of benefits. Sure, I mean, I think what that, um, is it Nadine is uh, referring to is um, benefits to an investor. So um, for Kickstarter uh, and Indiegogo, um, you are, you are um, putting in funding for the product uh, and you're getting a reward usually some, some aspect of the product um, in its prototype phase or beyond. We also do that in equity crowdfunding, but uh, the difference is that you are actually investing in the company. And so uh, at a future point in time, and this is the, the mechanism is called a crowd safe, which is a secure agreement for future equity, you will actually be an investor in the company. So you will you will hold equity in the company, and if it goes public, you'll get a piece of that. Um, if it's sold, you'll get a piece of that. So it's a, a complicated transaction, but that's the big difference. Got it. Um, so that, that's that's really, I think, a powerful differentiator, and uh, the fact that you can invest as little as $20 certainly is exciting. Um, there's a, an extension to the question. Do you see uh, from another listener, do you see downsides to having a term sheet with many more participants? Is there any impact on business decisions? Sure, and um, you know, it's again, we're 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 obviously um, risk takers, right? I mean, we have a startup. We work in global health. We <laughs> um, are doing equity crowdfunding. We have a very strong appetite for for risk. Um, that said. Um, and, and we're we're learning this live um, as as we go. Um, I should mention that one of the benefits of equity crowdfunding, or at least the way that Republic does it, is that the way it is structured, um, you really you deal with a single entry, uh, let's say, on your cap table for your business, um, and there are some intermediaries that organize and manage all these folks. Um, so from a, th that doesn't answer the business decision um, issue, but from just the mechanics of the business um, and the shareholders, they are, you know, managed as a group. Um, from a, yes, from the business impact decision, um, absolutely makes a difference. So, uh, you know, we'll we'll have to see, but we we do feel very much accountable, and we are accountable to those folks who invested in the Nova Vale line, and um, we have to report to them not just product milestones, but also the business milestones um, related to that line of our our business. And because there are so many of them, and because of the public nature of the raise, um, you know, they do weigh quite heavily in in the business decisions. Um, so, you know, for example, had this not been raised through equity crowdfunding and we ran into, let's say, X, Y, and Z stumbling blocks related to Novavale, we might say, well, let's delay that, you know, let's put that product on hold. Um, we do not have the same sense that we can, can or should do that um, because of the type of investors that we have behind that product. Um, so that's sort of a general way of, of answering it, that yes, it, it, it absolutely does affect the business. Um, thank you, that's really a deeply insightful answer. 
another question now pivoting a little bit towards the technology itself and, and uh, the impact of the technology. In the case of Zika-infected women, apart from microcephaly, which is an impact to their newborn, are there any other avoidable outcomes? Avoidable outcomes. I, I'm, so like I said, the way I'm reading this question is, what are other um, effects of the Zika virus beyond microcephaly that uh, can be uh, avoided uh, through uh, technology like the 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 nasal veil, nasal veil, sorry. Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, um, there there are um, neurological effects um, that they don't fully understand um, in the adults that contract uh, Zika. So it's not, you know, the biggest, most dramatic, visible, and long-lasting effect that we can see right away is this um, what happens to the newborn, to, to the fetus in the first few months. Um, there, there are neurological effects, um, which I'm not particularly well equipped to describe in adults who contract uh, Zika. There are um, problems ranging from eyesight. There's a lot of eyesight-related issues um, beyond the disability and the, the neurological issues. Um, and then there's just movement and, and behavioral issues um, that are related to the disease. And then they're only beginning to understand what the impact of co-infection with, you know, say you get dengue and Zika together are. Um, there is good news on another front that, you know, some um, medical findings that um, uh, you could intervene in other ways um, with a vaccine, for example, um, to prevent uh, the virus. Um, I hope that answers the question. Absolutely, especially because the follow-up question from the same listener was about the Zika virus vaccine. So I think you've hit, hit it right there. But um, I, I, you did mention that you were looking at um, other applications of the Nova Veil, including uh, malaria, obviously, dengue. Um, uh, what, uh, how far in those investigations are you, uh, how close are you to releasing, uh, I guess, to other versions of the Nova Veil uh, that are applicable to other diseases? Sure. Um, well, there's a couple of different strains to the answer. So the same products that are, we're manufacturing right now, um, so those four designs that you saw, um, so if, if someone were to wear them, um, they would have a certain level of protection against the mosquito carrying all of those diseases, um, both kinds of mosquito, the one that carries malaria and the one that carries uh, Zika, chikungunya, dengue, et cetera, um, as well as ticks. Um, our challenge is going to be we're going to have to, particularly in the U.S., um, for Lyme, we're going to have to do extended studies um, to show uh, exactly how protected people are before we can sell this within the U.S. and say that it is apparel that protects you from Lyme, for example. Um, aside from the, you know, this maternity concept, I mean, certainly folks have already asked, well, what about a wrap or a sling or a cover uh, for the baby. Um, and in fact, the way that Alessandra Gold de designed the scarf, the camouflage um, scarf, is that it is for a woman to wear over her head, around her neck, but it is also um, for a woman to wear while breastfeeding or, or to, to put over the baby's cradle. Um, so, you know, we don't know, I mean, we certainly know that um, any insect bite uh, for a newborn or an infant is, is not, uh, you know, not a positive sign. So that would be our next line of defense and, and work um, would be on, on uh, products for, for children and for, for newborns. That is really exciting to hear, Meg, uh, especially again, I, I think of myself as a, a prime <laughs> candidate and customer for a product like that. Uh, one last question before we have to wrap up. Um, many of the uh, end users of, of, of the Nova Leo would be in um, 
really underserved communities, low-income communities worldwide. We haven't talked about the price point uh, around this clothing, but how have you, if you can speak to it, how have you structured this in order to make it uh, accessible financially for those types of consumers, for the base of the pyramid consumers? Sure, that's a great question and, and something we, you know, struggle with the messaging because if we have, you know, we have a picture of a model in Miami wearing the outfit and it was designed by someone who does high-end designs. Um, but, you know, it, it, was, it was designed to have that look but be very affordable. Um, uh, so the price point, um, as with everything, varies tremendously based on, on volumes. Um, but our target customer um, for the base of the pyramid is the health system um, or the, the clinics uh, and, and others who are looking for a way to protect uh, women. Um, that's really our primary customer. So we're looking at the dress being uh, uh, subsidized by the sales in uh, higher income countries. Um, and so I, we actually don't have the final price point, but um, you know, I will say that the entire design and production and distribution strategy is uh, being developed, and really the business model is being developed so that it will be affordable uh, for women at the, the base of the pyramid. And in the same way that we worked with um, AmeriCares in El Salvador, you know, the, the women actually didn't pay for, for the, the prototypes they received. They were received as part of a package. They didn't pay for anything in the anti-Zika um, mother kit. They're low-income women at highest risk, and that's uh, how we would hope to um, and plan to, you know, get this to them, that, that it, it would be a public health tool, not a, not a luxury item that they would have to purchase. Uh, we did, we have been talking to a U.S.-based Department of Public Health um, that is interested in vector control because they've got a large number of um, folks who do hail from the Caribbean originally or are visiting family and go back and forth and uh, they're specifically interested in uh, the maternity dress as a form of vector control in their anti-Zika mother kits. Um, so not a straight answer on price, but that, you know, the, the, it was designed for base of the pyramid and uh, that's how we, we plan to uh, proceed. Well, many times in social entrepreneurship, there is no such thing as a straight answer per se, uh, but I, I appreciate your honesty and, and transparency in sharing where you are in the process. And um, with that, we, we have uh, gone a couple minutes over time, I hope, uh, and I'm actually quite certain that most of our participants don't mind. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Meg, for, for sharing your experiences uh, in developing this novel technology and also raising funding to support it. Uh, very exciting to, to hear about your journey. And I, I'd like to thank you like, heartily for sharing it with us. And I'd like to thank all of our attendees today. Um, if, uh, for those of you who are seeking to get PDHs, the code is listed on the slide. If you have questions that we didn't address, please feel free to email us at webinarsengineeringforchange.org. And don't forget to become an E4C member to get information about upcoming webinars. There will be a recording of this webinar available, and you will receive notification about it. With that, I'd like to thank everybody. Wish you all a good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you are. And look forward to catching you on the next E4C webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye.